Hey guys, as promised, um, I am doing uh, to mark the anniversary of the 80th anniversary of the Dam Busters raid uh, carried out by 617 Squadron um, with 19 Lancasters. Um, um, I'm going to be doing an inbox review on a kit I've had in Mustache. Um, and uh, Anybody who knows about the Dam's Ray, that many books have been written about it. Um, there was one feature film made about it in 1956, which was released, which you can still get on DVD. Um, there is rumours that Peter Jackson is going to be at some stage do a reboot of the actual uh, story, uh, but nothing has come of it yet, as of yet. Um, but uh, it was one of the most um, well-known air raids during the Second World War and the most audacious air raid of the Second World War um, considering the amount of time it was put together and how short it was put together. Um, basically um, the idea was thought up by the well-known inventor um, Barnes Wallace uh, who basically thought of the actual design for the Wellington in the geodetic structure, uh, as well as um, designing the R101 airship. Um, he put forward a proposal um, of, of uh, a bomber to specialise in the raid at first, uh, which was then rejected um, and uh, never came through fruition. And then obviously this proposal was put through it was rejected again, so he decided to resign from Vickers. Um, and then on his final attempt, uh, when he actually went and saw um, the head of Bomber Command, um, Bomber Harris, who basically decided, decided to go ahead with the idea. And in the space of around, well, I think it was about eight weeks, um, they uh, brought the crews uh, forward and decided that Guy Gibson, uh, one of the most experienced um, um, air commanders of Bomber Command, would um, lead the raid. And he selected the 50, uh, well, all the crew for the 19 Lancasters. And uh, um, he was. He, he could be a bit of a tyrant by all accounts, but to be honest with him, his men stuck right behind him. Um, they all respected him, and um, that's what really clinched it, really. And they were basically not told about the raid until the briefing. So they didn't know as to why they were flying low level um, over the Derwent Dams um, until the actual briefing. Um... Initially, they tried to drop the bomb at 150 feet, but they kept having problems where it kept smashing. And then, basically, um, Barnes Wallace came up with the idea of uh, basically asking them, can we do it 60 feet? Because that would actually help with the upkeep bomb ricocheting towards the dam. Um, when it was successful on that attempt. Um, so therefore the raid went ahead um, and um, 19 Lancasters uh, took off from Scampton uh, I think around about 9.29 p.m. the first airwave of the uh, raid went out around about 9.29 p.m. Uh, which I think was Guy Gibson with two other aircraft uh, and then obviously around about 10 o'clock the third wing, second wing and I think around about 11, 10, 30 or 11, the third wing went out. Um, one aircraft had a technical issue and had to return. Um, in fact, one aircraft on the final wing, I think, um, was having technical issues. So a spare was brought in. Um, and I think that took off around about two o'clock in the morning. Um, and was one of the last to drop uh, down uh, a bomb. Unfortunately, it didn't breach it, and that was around about six o'clock in the morning. Uh, but out of, of 19 Lancasters, only 11 returned, so it was high, a high attrition rate, fortunately, and 53 air crew were lost on the raid. Um, initially, Barnes Wallace had euphoria, but when he learned about the loss, it affected him deeply. Um, and apparently uh, Gibson said to him when he came back, he said, 
if you'd asked those boys to have done it again, they would have done so anyway. So there you go. But it did affect him for the rest of his life. Um, so he um, made sure that anything that he proposed would ensure that it wouldn't have such long, well, have such a high attrition rate ever again. Um, I think the bomb, uh, well, it was one of two, uh, one called Highball, which was a circular bomb. Uh, which was experimented with on another squadron called 617 Flying Mosquitoes and they were actually going to initially use that against shipping targets and um, possibly out in the raid on Japan but it never came to fruition. Um, Highball had a lot of problems, they had a lot of pro issues with that um, so they de decided on a, another design which was more like a barrel called Upkeep and it was more, far more successful, which, uh, which was the bomb that was used on the raid. And um, obviously 19 of those Lancasters, plus a spare, were specially converted for the raid uh, to carry with, with a cradle underneath what was the bomb bay. And obviously had a spinning mechanism. Um, because Barnes Wallace got the idea of that from, believe it or not, Nelson. Because he used to basically spin his cannonballs uh, to basically let them bounce. Uh, towards the enemy ship, so that's where he got his idea from. So there, yeah, there's a little lesson you didn't know. Anyway, I'm waffling on, um, and what we'll do is just turn the camera around, and then we'll get on with the inbox review itself. Because basically, the reason I'm doing it, as I said last night, is a tribute to all those boys that took part. More essentially, the 53 that didn't return. So there you go. So here we go. And there we have it. Um, this is the kit that I had in my stash. Now I've had this some quite some years. Uh, I think about five years actually. Um, I got it on eBay. Uh, it's featuring one aircraft which was actually one that actually took part in um, dropping the upkeep bomb on the Sulphur Dab. And uh, the navigator on that was the late Johnny Johnson who was the last surviving member of that raid who I think passed away around about December. And uh, next to that is the book that uh, my father actually quoted to me, which was written by the man himself, Guy Gibson, in his account of the raid. Um, so, as I say, it was recommended highly by my father. Um, I actually saw this in Tesco's, a cheap price, and I thought, do you know what, I'm going to read it. So as soon as I finish reading the other books, this is next on the agenda. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so here we go. Uh, you've got one of two aircraft which are actually um, an option on the box. AJT which was the actual aircraft um, flown by, uh, which is the aircraft that uh, was navigated by Johnny Johnson at Salford Dam. And the other one I think which is AJ, hang on let me have a look here, can't see without my glasses. E. Um, I think that one was one of the aircraft that was lost on the raid. I might be mistaken, I don't know. Um, but there you go. Um, beautiful illustration on the front there of the actual uh, Lancaster finally dropping the Sulper Dam because apparently they did about eight passes over the actual dam. And then when he said bomb gone, they all went, thank God for that. <laughs> Let's go on. So there you go. Um, and thankfully, that was one of the Lancasters that did actually return uh, from the raid. I think he basically got back about um, four o'clock in the morning or four thirty in the morning at Scampton. So uh, yeah. Anyway, without further ado, we're going to get on with this one. This was an old kit. Uh, this was one of the initial releases, um, which is kit number. A one, oh, sorry, A O nine double O seven, which you can see on there. Um, and uh, as I say, you've got two color options: A J T, which is the aircraft that Johnny Johnson flew on, and A J E, which I have a feeling was one of the Ancasters that was lost to the raid. Uh, so there you go. And on the side there, you've got the CAD drawings of the upkeep bomb and the cradle it stood on, and then you've got the actual. Uh, mechanism uh, for the upkeep bomb underneath the bomb bay 
uh, front nose there with the front gun, uh, bomb aimers position, and then obviously you've got the CAD um, picture of the actual flaps and the undercarriage there. Um, again, you've got the box art illustration on the side and up underside the other way. If I turn it around that way, you've got the two colour options um, in the kit. Um, actually, as I say, uh, this, the first one is AJT, which was the one Johnny Johnson flew on as a navigator, flying by Flight Lieutenant Joseph Charles McCarthy, uh, Canadian Air Force, 617 Squadron, Operation Chastise, Scampton, 16th, 17th of May, 43. And the other aircraft is flown by Flight Lieutenant Robert Norman George Barlow, uh, Australian Air Force, on the same raid. So there you go. Um, it's quite a big box, it's a thick old box. Um, you've got one, two bags of sprues containing the decal sheets as well as the instructions. Um, so I'm basically going to snip them open. And as you can see here, in fact, I've already done it because I had a crafty look at it some time ago. So what I'll do first is bring out the instruction sheet, which I normally run through. Okay, let's just put the box down there. Move the scissors out of the way and then go through that. Again, you've got a little history of the kit and the subject matter and about the raid. Um, it's done in pamphlet form, the old pamphlet form. And then I've got one opening it up. You've got all the indicators in all the various different languages and then all the symbols um, used during the process of the build. Okay, um, so next up from that is the first stage, which funnily enough, you actually start with a bomb bay, believe it or not. And it's actually indicating the holes where to put in the cradle. And then obviously you've got the side bulkheads which go on. And then you've got the main wing spar, which goes on. Following that is the assembly of the pilot seat. And obviously you can recognise it's got the actual protective... Um, uh, oh, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> oh dear, I'm terrible today. It's been a long day. Bulkhead there uh, to protect... Uh, and it was a, with, a 45 with armour to protect the pilot's uh, back and head. And then it's actually put onto the cockpit floor. Obviously, you put the pilot in if you should so wish. And then you've got the main steering column, which goes on. And then the actual cockpit uh, column there. That is then basically put onto the lower part fuselage containing the bomb bay. And there's a decal sheet for the control column, which is then fitted onto the cockpit floor. And then obviously on the side here are decals for the engineering sections, um, or navigators section, uh, etc. And obviously the colour guide. Following on from that, you put all the glass glazings into the interior of the fuselage. And it's basically telling you to cut that there, because obviously that's got to fit in the uh, specialised bomb bay. Um, that goes in on the right hand, left hand side of the fuselage uh, with the assembly including the um, wing spar and then obviously after that the next process is to put in the actual um, bomb aimers uh, site which actually goes into the bomb bay uh, and then obviously you know, you've got the bulkhead there for the I think it's the yeah the wireless operator, um, along with or is it navigator? No, sorry, it's the navigator, along with the seat and the uh, bulkhead, as well as a decal sheet following the maps. So he's got his desk there all set up, and then a bulkhead underneath as well, which goes onto the bulk cockpit floor. Okay, having done that. Uh, that section is then fitted in behind the cockpit. Okay. And the next section is, believe it or not, uh, there was a machine gun under the actual, uh, just by the bomb bay there on this particular version of the Lancaster. And in, yes, it is also in the old 148 Tamiya kit because they actually 
dug up the wreckage of an air, one of the aircraft that was down and found this. So there you go. Um, obviously, because they made up a turret was removed, they could do this. Next up, um, you've got a... Hang on, let me see. I don't know what that is going in there. Oh, uh, yeah, because you would have had three lights. That's just to blank them off, I think. Um, and then, obviously, moving on from that, you've got the uh, engineer's seat, which goes in um, on the right-hand side of the fuselage, along with all the glazing. And, obviously, they're in telling you where to cut off the points, which would normally be for the normal bomb bay on the bank. And once that is done, both the fuselage shards are zipped up. And then obviously moving on from that, where the wing spar is, you've got the inserts for the uh, undercarriage bay, which go on either side. Um, and then obviously you've got the firewalls for the engines, which go on. And then following on from that, that is then um, obviously painted on the interior for the flaps and the interior of the fuselage, etc. And then the upper part of the wing is inserted on like so. Okay. Next step. Obviously the um, navigation lights go in, which was used to basically uh, make sure that the aircraft was um, flying at 60 feet. So you put the lower part of the wings on, as you can see there. Following on from that is the assembly of the tail planes um, as well. And then obviously you've got the radiator grills which go in on the air ducts. And then obviously once that's done, the tail planes go on the rear of the fuselage. And obviously you've got the colour call out for where the um, tail end Charlie's going to go. Uh, the air grills go in the outboard engines as you can see there. Uh, they are in ducts, okay, and then obviously you've got the um, exhaust mufflers which go on um, as well, and then the air filters as well. Right, once that is done, same with the inboard engines as well, same process again, and then following on from that, You've got the rear bulk, you've got the actual uh, front bulk head for the undercarriage bay where you've got the fire extinguishers and the tank for the um, fluid mechanism for the hydraulics. Okay, so that's fitted on there. Exhaust shrouds go on again. Inboard engines are put onto the wing. Then the outer engines are put onto the wing. And then right here, you've got the added option, um, I think, what's this? Um, not quite sure what that one is. I think that's just for your, oh yeah, that's for your bay doors. So you cut those two bits off if you're going to have the undercarriage up and in flying mode and then inserted. But if you're not, which is what I'm going to do, you then put the main hydraulic wheel um, undercarriage in. To the wheelbase and then obviously you've got more of the rear hydraulics which fit in as like so as you can see there um, and then more sponsons go on as well as you can see there okay and then following on from that you put the undercarriage bay doors on as you can see there and then the next step I'm going to have a look here. This is quite an in-depth build. Um, is the rear part, the engine cowlings, and the flaps which go on as well, as you can see there. Um, so if you wanted that into a sort of a position where it was sitting there on the ground with the flaps down, you can do. Either way, it's your option. Okay, so there you go. And it's just showing you which you can use. If you want the flaps down, you've got one part there. If you want the flaps up, then there's another part there. Okay, so you've got the added option. I'll probably have it with the flaps down as it's come to rest. Then you've got the front coverings for the firewalls, which you can see there, which go onto the wings. Okay. And then you've got the assembly of the tail planes and rudder. Then they are fitted onto the rear tail planes, as you can see there. And then the next stage 
is the fitment of the front of the bomb um, of the actual specialized bomb bay. What was it? No, it's the rear actually of the specialized bomb bay, which you can see there for this particular version of the aircraft. And then obviously you've got some of the mechanism for the I think which was used for the spindle I think for the main cradle of where the upkeep bomb went that was the actual engineering mechanism okay so that's quite nice detail there and then obviously you got the wing you got the sponsons for the actual um assembly for holding the upkeep bomb that goes down there and then you got the bulkhead which goes in and then obviously you've got the front two Bombay part the Bombay doors which close and then obviously then you've got the actual uh, gear mechanism which goes on which are used for spinning the actual upkeep bombs and then obviously the next process is the re assembly of the rear um, undercarriage leg and then obviously you've got uh, weighted wheels for the main undercarriage wheels, which is a nice touch. They then go onto the actual undercarriage bonsons. And as you can see there, right in the middle is that rear mounted gun. And then obviously the glazing goes on for the bomb aimers position. As you can see there. Along with the front light, which was one of the two lights which were on the main fuselage to line up when it was at 60 feet to drop the bomb. Um, next up, if you were to do the standard version, it just runs through the process of all the turrets and assemblies there, which go in mid upper. I wouldn't even worry about that because that's not obligatory. Um, and obviously you've got the front turret and the rear end turret right there which go in onto the aircraft. Then you've got the glazing of the actual cockpit itself which goes on and then the cover for the front, uh, well the fairing uh, as well of the front uh, turret. Next up from that is the assembly of the engine cowlings and the propeller shafts, etc., and propeller nose. They then go onto the actual aircraft. And then I think after that, if I can get in that final page, on, where are we? Is the assembly of the cradle for the upkeep bomb, which you can see right there. Okay. And obviously you've got a decal uh, which was put on the actual upkeep bomb itself. And I have to say that's the most accurate looking upkeep bomb I've ever seen. Because the one on the old Revell kit was mm, dubious to say the least. And then obviously you've got the sponsons for the um, or was it fairings which go onto the lower part of the tail planes which go on there. And obviously you've got the option if you want to have it on a stand which you can actually buy separately from Airfix. And then obviously you've got the assemblies which go on to the top of the um, flaps. And that's your kit built. So there you go. Now, colour colour options. Typical colour options. Um, first one is of... The aircraft flown by Charles McCarthy, the Royal Canadian Air Force, set on the raid of the 16th, 17th of May, 1943. And obviously that was the one where Johnny Johnson was the navigator. Uh, overall black underneath uh, with light um, with, with light earth on the top of one with the more traditional olive green camo. And the upkeep on that, surprisingly, is a... Green as well, and then obviously the second option is of the aircraft flown by um, George Barlow uh, of the Australian Air Force on the same raid. Um, I'm not sure if he survived. I think he may have. I may be mistaken. Just leave a comment in the comments column if you can correct me. So that's the actual instruction sheet gone through, and that's taken me nearly 25 minutes, believe it or not. Now what we're going to have a look at is the actual kit itself. I'm going to take the main sprues out first. I'm going to turn them upside down because they're all in sequence. 
And the first one we come across is the lower part of the wings. Beautifully, beautifully moulded, which you can see there. And obviously you've got the lights in the wings there. Um, for the port wing. And as I say, we, the panel lines on it are absolutely beautifully represented. And obviously the stressed uh, fabric on the actual um, elevator as well. It's very, very nicely done. Um, again, on the other wing as well, beautifully moulded. And obviously you've got the... One of the tail planes there again, lovely panel line detail, nice and crisp and crispy molded. You've got the uh, tail uh, rudders there as well as the main tail plane, beautifully molded again, as you can see there. Sorry about the shaky hands, I'm trying to hold this with one arm is not easy, so that's that knife. Beautifully done again, lovely detail, and obviously, these are the firewalls inside the uh. Bombay, I think. Um, I may be mistaken, I don't know. And obviously that's one of the wing spars that you've got there. And the weighted wheels, which is a nice touch because that really accentuates the weight of the aircraft, including the bomb. And then obviously you've got the beautifully moulded uh, right-hand side of the fuselage, which you can see there. In fact, if you wanted to, you could actually sort of cut around that and open the door as though they were climbing into the aircraft, if you can get some figures. And then on the inside, it's beautifully detailed again, especially along the bomb bay and the actual cockpit wall uh, when, where the engineer station is. And obviously in the bomb bay as well, there's some lovely detail there as well. So that's that. And then the next one. Oops, I know what's happened here. I think it's come off of one of the sprues. Oh well, never mind. Um, is the engine in engines which you've got there, including the fuse or undercarriage bays, beautifully moulded and crisp, lovely panel line detail again, especially with those rivets. Very nicely done. Um, I think this is the seat for the engineer. Yep, it is. And then obviously you've got them part of the mechanism for the lower gun at the back of the fuselage. Uh, lovely reproduced um, propeller blades. You've actually got two sets. I don't know if it was the paddles that were on the Mark 1 or if it was these ones. I'm not sure. I'll have to do some research on that. Again, I think that's basically to show that they were going to do other versions of the Lank. Um, again, on here... Uh, you've got the front covers for the firewalls on the wings, access panels. I think this bit here, I think it's part of the air in, yeah, it's the air inlets there. I'm not quite sure what these, oh, this is the fairing that goes on the front of the front upper turret. Um, and then obviously you've got the outer engines there, which is nicely done on the halves. And then obviously you've got the radiators right there with the air ducts. To cool the engines beautifully reproduced and even the exhausts um, lovely work on those as well though you're not going to see them once you get the uh, uh, exhaust shrouds on and then obviously you've got the frontal nose of the propellers and the side air vents as well nicely done okay next up You've got part of the Bombay there, which you can see again, nice detail on that as well. So you probably nicely weather that. That's another one of the wing spars. Lower part of the tail planes, another part of the rudders there and tail plane. Upper part of the wings again, lovely panel line detail. And I love the stressed effect on the um, elevators as well. Very nicely done. And again, like the other side, of the fuselage, the left hand side is beautifully reproduced as well, and on the inside, and there's a little bit more detail there where you've got some panels there, and obviously, you've got the um, navigators station there as well, very nicely done, and obviously, in the Bombay compartment as well, that's nicely reproduced there. 
Uh, so yes, and then we'll see the interior detail for the flaps, which is nicely done, and the actual interior for the um, undercarriage bay is nicely reproduced, and you can really go to town on the weathering on that as well, with the oil leaks, etc. And obviously, again, you got the weighted wheels, which is nicely reproduced, the flaps, um, and that's it really on that one. Following on from that, ah, oh, I know what's happened here. Um, we've got, because this is basically in collusion with the normal standard length that you get, you've got the fairy, you've got the colourful, the mid upper turret, you've even got the Bombay cradles, but this is not applicable to this kit. Um, and then you've got the pilot's figure there. If I can get it to get in focus. It's not focusing. It's not bad. It's not bad. Um, and then obviously you've got the undercarriage uh, doors there. And I think this is to do with the airspeed indicators there as well. Um, there's one part of the normal, what would normally be the normal Bombay doors. And the other one's fallen off. And then obviously you've got the actual actuators for the undercarriage, which you can see there, which is nicely detailed. Although, unfortunately, right here you've got two weld marks, which you could easily sand off and feel. So there you go. Again, the detail on them is beautifully reproduced. So very, very nicely done on that one. And obviously that's your rear tail wheel, I think. Um, so yeah, so that's that. And what have we got here? Oh yeah, these are the firewalls for the interior of the undercarriage bays, which you can see there. You've got the hydraulic tank for the hydraulic fluid um, on the front one there, which is nicely reproduced. And then obviously the rear part of the undercarriage bays as well. Um, then obviously you've got the alternative for the flaps, which you can see there, which is the rear and the engine covers. And then obviously you've got the um, interior framework for the undercarriage bay as well, which is nicely reproduced, I must say. Um, and then obviously flaps, the interior detail, the flaps, which is nicely done. You've got the undercart for the rear tear wheel. Uh, that's your rear gun, I think, for underneath on the bottom of the fuselage. Um, then you've got your cockpit panel there, with which you actually put a decal on. Although you can sort aftermarket if you want to make it look more enhanced. Then you've got parts of the turrets, which you can see there. And the actual Browning machine guns as well, which you know, are not bad in this scale, I have to say. Um, so yeah. And what else have we got? Um, obviously you've got the pilot seat with the rear bulkhead to protect him which is armoured and obviously there's some nice detail with the actual cushion padded there as well very nicely done i think the seat belts you'll either have to get aftermarket or just use some masking tape to be honest with you okay if you don't put the pilot in and obviously this is Part of the mechanism, this is the front part that goes on the front part of the Bombay. Uh, that's the rear part there. And then obviously you've got the various parts of the mechanism and the winch. And there's your wheels for your cradle. And there's your uh, bulkheads, which are actually to hold the upkeep bomb. Um, and that obviously goes down the lower part of the fuselage, or the Bombay, sorry. Uh, God, I'm losing it. And that's obviously your chassis for your bomb cradle. Um, and then there's the two, well, three, four parts for the upkeep bomb, which is very nicely reproduced, I have to say. And then obviously you've got the mechanism for the uh, lower turret. Okay, so that's that. And then, obviously, we've got the clear parts. Uh, where did I put those? I put them down here somewhere. Where have they gone? What have I done with them? Ah, oh, here we go. I'm going to keep them in the bag uh, because I don't want them to get damaged. Again, 
This is the H2S radar, which would be on the standard um, model of your Lank, and obviously the mid-upper turret glazing, which doesn't feature on this aircraft because they tried that. They wanted to keep the weight down for the aircraft, so that's why they removed it. Obviously, you've got two versions of glazings for the bomb base, which I don't understand why they've done that. Um, obviously, you've got the side glass sections for the canopy. Um, I think, again, on this, some had them without the... Um, fairing on and some had them with them. I think I'm going to have to do some research on this and find out what was what. So you've got the front uh, glazing for the front turret and then obviously you've got all the landing lights as well as the glazing for the side of the fuselage and again I think on this one which is the main part of the actual cockpit, sorry if the writing's there in the way, I don't know if you can see it, actually I should have to turn it upside down some nice frame there, there and I'm sure you can get some mask sets and it'll be easy to mask anyway. So there you go. And then finally, you got your decal sheet, which I think is reproduced by Cartograph um, of AJE or AJT. I'm going to do AJT and they've even got, as you can see there, it's a decal. Uh, you got your control columns for the wireless operator and navigator. And obviously there's your control column decal. And um, obviously you've got all the decals for the upkeep bomb as well as the actual aircraft itself. So I'm sure they'll go down well. Being cartograph, you shouldn't have any problems with them anyway. So that, in a nutshell, is it. Um, that's going to be getting on for what? It's just over 35 minutes now. Wow. <laughs> It's one of the longest inbox reviews I've done in a long time. Um, as I say, this is just a one-off really, guys, because obviously it's the anniversary of the dams raid. Uh, 80 years ago today, the 11 returning aircraft returned. Um, so there you go. And it's a raid that uh, would end up becoming part of history. And obviously, it was the first operation of 617 Squadron, which went on from strength to strength. And in fact... They are still flying today, but with F-35B fighters, which um, times are allocated on the carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. Um, the new kit of this, which has been reissued, um, you've got one which I think is going to be coming out on its own, and then you've got the anniversary set, which has actually got the Lancaster, I think of Gibson's aircraft. Uh, flying alongside an F-35B, uh, the current squadron. Um, so that, I think, is a current release. Um, this one was issued, I think, during the course of the 70th or 60th anniversary. This one will be released. Um, but I have to say, out of all the Lancaster kits you can get in 172nd, I recommend Airfix because of the detail. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, that's about it. I'm just finishing it off, putting all the screws back in the bag, along with the decal sheet and the clear transparencies, which are all safe and sound for a time in the future when I get around to building it. So yeah, there we go, back in its box, safe and sound, along with the instruction sheet. And there you go. So, if you want to talk, depict these two aircraft, then obviously you see if you can get these on eBay. I don't think they're producing this one anymore. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, do get one if you can. Um, I'd heartily recommend it. Uh, probably even the current releases, uh, obviously, because they're commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Dam Busters raid. And um, pick up a copy of that if you can as well. Because that's actually written by the uh, guy, the man himself, uh, squadron leader Guy Gibson. And it was his own memoirs of the actual raid itself. So there you go. Um, I'll just turn the camera around and then we'll finish off. And there you have it, guys. That is my tribute to um, 617 Squadron and the Dam Busters which took part in the most famous raid of the Second World War, uh, Operation Chastise. Um, and it's 
basically to all of those, more especially the 53 crew <coughs> who didn't come back, so lest we forget. Anyway, that's it for now, guys. Um, I don't think I'm going to be doing any more inbox reviews until sometime in the future when I'm in a better position, but um, I just thought I would do it as a tribute to uh, the Dan Busters on this special 80th anniversary. So there you go. In the meantime, get kit, kit, sorry, got tongue tied. In the meantime, get kit crazy, happy modelling, and take care. Cheers.